Welcome to the 2021 Indiana Black Expo Minority Small Business Series presented by KeyBank. Today's webinar topic is one of the most critical subjects for new and existing small businesses, getting your finances in shape to access opportunities. Our panel of experts will provide you with tax and financial information needed in preparation for funding opportunities for your business. I am Tammy Butler Robinson, CEO of Engaging Solutions. I will be your host for this afternoon's session. I would like to thank all of the sponsors and partners for this webinar. Before we start, I have a few housekeeping rules for you. First, if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box and we will answer as many as possible before our session ends. Also, toward the end of the session, there will be a link to the survey in the chat box. We ask that you will fill out the survey to assist us with planning future webinars. The panelists for today's session are Courtney Richel, Regional Director of West Central Indiana Small Business Development Center, Lois Thomas, CPA and owner of ELT Accounting Services, LLC, and Kiana Davis, CEO and lead accountant, Mind Your Business. Our first panelist is Ms. Courtney Ritchie, IBE and the Indiana Small Business Development Center are partnering to host webinars and online forums with a focus towards supporting both existing and startup minority businesses in areas of corporate structure, finance, and business planning. I'm very excited to be here with you today. I am the regional director for the West Central Indiana Small Business Development Center. I think that my uh, PowerPoint might be coming up on the screen here in a moment um, as I had a couple of technical issues today, which uh, we would think a year into Zoom that wouldn't happen. But uh, even if it doesn't, I'm super excited to talk to you about why it is important to take control of your finances. So if you've not worked with the Indiana Small Business Development Center before, I strongly encourage that you reach out to your local office. We have 10 offices within the state. You can go to www.isbdc.org to be able to see what um, office covers your county. But what we do is we offer one-on-one -on -one business advice uh, for small businesses. So here we go, great. All together as a team, we'll make it happen. That's what this is about, right? Um, so, Marsh, you can go ahead and go um, on to the next slide here. Um, so, what we do is we offer one on one advice um, for you and your business. So, everything I talk about today, if at the end of it you really feel like you need more one on one um, advice for your specific business, please reach out to us because we want to be able to help you. You can go on and advance to the next couple of slides here. So, what I first want to start off with um, is that why it's important for you to take control of your finances. A lot of times as a business owner, um, I think we look at our finances and how we're tracking our finances um, to just take care of our taxes at the end of the year, right? Um, and that is not the case. When you started your business, um, you started it to make money. Um, so what's so funny is that once we're up and we're going and we're doing everything that we love, a lot of times the money is what we avoid, um, but it can really help you in a lot of different ways. You can go ahead and advance to the next slide here. So whether you, I would assume if you're here and you're on the call today, that you're already in business. So hopefully you uh, figured out how to fund it to get started, but you're always going to need money in your business. So whether you're in an inventory-based business or maybe you are a service provider, you're going to have expenses before you actually um, usually receive payment for your services rendered. And a lot of times you need something like a line of credit to be able to help you with your cash flow. Or you might have the opportunity to expand and you need a loan. Uh, we have that all the, time, all the time in our office. We have people come to us and um, they need funding because they have this great opportunity. And usually the opportunity needs to be um, conquered within the next 60 days. And they're trying to access funding um, from a local lending institution. Um, and to do that, you typically need a business plan. You need sales projections. And if you don't have your financials um, all organized and ready to go, it can really hinder your ability to potentially move forward and actually get that capital you need. You might lose opportunities. Um, so I hope you enjoy my morning meeting, but this is true. You never know when that opportunity is going to come around. So if you just have a box of receipts, it's going to be really hard um, for you to uh, get that together in a timely manner. 
also we saw a lot, especially when the pandemic hit, um, you know, there were a lot of uh, COVID-19 relief options through PPP, the restart grant, idle, the restaurant revitalization, if I've got any restaurant owners on here, those came around and they were quick. And the people that had their financials ready to go and could print out income statements and can show their loss of sales, they were able to access that money. Um, but the individuals that didn't, they had a huge um, disadvantage in trying to get everything together to just be able to apply. Um, so that's that's one big thing, being able to move forward. Also, if you are a business owner, more than likely, um, whether you're a sole proprietor, uh, this is your personal income. So when you are at the stage where you want um, something individually for yourself and your family, like a mortgage, or um, even with the, the pandemic, um, when they did unemployment, they had to be able to show your income to be able to access that. And if you're not able to uh, pull look, quickly pull and look, it's hard for you to show your actual proof of income. So that's another reason it's really important. Also, your business exit strategy. So we all start a business and sometimes we don't think about, you know, what's, what's our end game here. But more than likely, you're building a business to either sell it or hand it down to your kids. Um, and you, you got to know what your business is worth. If you are go to sell your business, the buyer is going to be asking you for three years of financials, tax returns, financials. They're going to want to see POS data, sign contracts, all that kind of financial information to make sure that they want to buy it. And a lender is going to want to see it to be able to give those funds. So it's really important that you're able, because you never know when somebody might knock on the door and say, hey, I love what you've grown here. I want to buy it. And you've got to be able to produce those documents to be able to, again, uh, cease that opportunity. And the biggest thing and what I want to touch on today is be able, being able to make data driven decisions. At the end of the day, your finances is what drives everything in your business. Um, so being able to really take control and own that and know where you stand is going to help you make all different types of decisions within your business. Um, so you're going to go on to the, the next slide here. Um, so where do you start? And again, I know that we probably have business owners on here that just started, have been in business for five years, 10 years. Um, but I wanted to cover some basic things today that I think are best practices. So first off, if you're a sole proprietor, um, even though you don't have to have a separate bank account from your business account, it, you absolutely need one to be able to track everything. Even if you have a separate bank account, um, it might make sense for you to have multiple bank accounts um, to be able to track things better um, and to be able to um, you know, navigate your funds. I have a lot of people, these are just um, some examples here, definitely need an operations account. Um, a lot of times though, I have my clients, especially if they have sales tax, have a separate tax account um, so that they can take that sales tax every day and deposit it in there. So they know at the end of the month when they need to go pay sales tax, it's already there ready for them. But that's the same thing with your own tax, your own, uh, if you, especially if you're a service provider, um, it, you know, it's a good practice for you to each month take some funds out, you know, about 28%, depending on what your tax bracket is and where you think you're going to fall tax wise, but take that out and put it in a tax account so that at the end of the year, you don't find yourself in a sticky situation. Um, and also a capital account. So if there are things you know you're going to want to make improvements on um, and you want to put that money back, it's a good idea for you to just kind of navigate that so that you don't have this one account. It looks like things are going well. You got 50 grand in there. Um, and then you remember that, oh, I've got a, taxes are coming out, operations come out. So it just helps you a little bit to, to track that so you know really where you're at. The other is an accounting system. So like I said, it's so important that you're tracking everything. Um, so hopefully you're already using something. But if you're not, um, a lot of people like QuickBooks. QuickBooks is great and integrates with a lot of different um, applications. But if you're on this call, you may be just starting out. <laughs> you know, you might have that box of receipts or that um, ledger that you're writing down. So there, there are ways that even if QuickBooks, if you're not there yet, that you can get started. Um, I really like Wave apps. Wave is free for you to use. Um, also, there's a lot of industry specific software out there. So I'd also encourage you to look at that if you've not started um, tracking in an accounting system. One example is HoneyBook. HoneyBook is really more for service providers, um, but it has an accounting um, side to it. Plus, it'll let you use it as a CRM and um, to, to invoice out of. So there's a lot of functions, but there is something tech wise out there for you to start doing this and to streamline things and to save you time. 
Um, once you've decided what quick or what accounting system to use, or if you're already using one, you really have got to look at what an appropriate chart of accounts is for you. And what I mean is what income streams do you really want to track? Um, and what expenses do you really want to track? Because when we get to that data driven decisions, you want to be able to quickly look at something and be able to, to make decisions based on it. I had a gas station one time that they had over a million dollars in sales, but they put it all in just revenue. Well, they were ended up getting ready to go for a loan and they were going to buy a new place and they needed to be able to show what revenue streams they thought were going to increase um, from gas and, you know, their convenience sales and their little food spot. Well, it was so hard for us to get in there and really dig deep and see what division of their business their sales was coming from because they just had one lump revenue. Um, so it was really difficult. So really think about that. And on the expense side, um, also beyond your uh, QuickBooks, you really have got to have some type of a sales system. So I love Square. Um, it's free to use. Um, you can use it from your phone. You can use it online. You can do it as an e-commerce. Um, but there, that's just one example. Um, if you're a service-based person, a lot of times we're still in the habit of using Word documents to put together invoices and try and track it that way. But there are so many things out there now that you can do that. I'm going to go on to the next screen here for me. And then the reason, again, that we flow into why this is so, so important is that your business should have KPIs, key performance indicators. These are pieces of data that you're tracking that make sense for you. These are just a couple of the examples here, number of new sales, number of new customers, what your customer acquisition cost is. So how much did you spend in marketing to get that customer? What your actual cost is for a project if it's service-based? Those are all things that you should really um, look at your business and what's important and how you're going to know if you're going on the trajectory you planned with your business and the way that you're going to be able to get that data and make those decisions is by having, um, you know, a good accounting system, a good POS system, and really making sure the key data, the data you need that's going to help you make those decisions and be able to take advantage of opportunities is, uh, is what you're collecting and reporting out on. Um, and there are, are things out there that you can track this to, like monday.com or Excel. Um, and I've got my last slide up here. These are just a couple of questions that if they came up to you um, in your business on the next slide here, uh, that you would absolutely have to have good financial data to be able to do. And I guarantee you, these are all questions at some point you have asked, should I expand? When do I need to hire somebody? Is my marketing working? Am I profitable? If I were going to sell my business, what would I sell it for? Those are all things that are going to happen to you at some course in time in your business. And you have to have that financial data up to date and you're able to actually grab it and use it and see it and make sense of it to be able to, uh, to move forward and answer those decisions or make those decisions and answer those questions. So that's just a little bit of why I think it's important and I'm glad that we're here today as a panel to share information and then answer your questions to see what that next step is for you and your business. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Great information shared. Um, those KPIs, data-driven decisions that need to be made. Get that accounting system in place um, and think about having a separate account for Thank you, Courtney. We greatly appreciate the information that you shared. It was great information, letting us know how important it is um, to keep our focus on those KPIs, um, making sure we have an accounting system that is in place, um, and that we also have a separate account for our taxes. Make those data-driven decisions. Thank you so much, Courtney. At this time, we're going to have Lois, who is our next guest, Lois Thomas, the owner of ELT Accounting Services, LLC. Um, ELT is an MBEWBE certified accounting and tax services firm, and they provide accounting, budgeting, financial statement analysis, business and individual income tax preparation services, and other tax related services. At this time, I turn it into the hands of Lois Thomas. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you very much, Tammy, for that introduction. Uh, my presentation pretty much mirrors uh, Courtney, and I don't want to repeat all the uh, information Courtney provided, and that was great information. Uh, mine is a guide to financial statements and some control, internal control issues for owners. 
Uh, I think what I want to focus on is the internal, internal control issues uh, for owners. And um, I think Tammy, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Courtney uh, provided some excellent information on the importance of financial statements and some uh, guides for the uh, uh, business owners, our audience uh, to follow. So I, in, in the essence of time, I don't want to, you know, reiterate those things, but I do have a 10 page uh, PowerPoint presentation that if anyone wants access to it for more information, you're more than welcome to it. So uh, Marsha, if you would uh, just go to uh, page um, slide number six, and we'll just talk about some importance of uh, internal controls. Um, and um, for most business owners, they control the entire operations and that's okay, that's fine. Um, but we uh, want to sure that you understand the importance of having some internal control policies in place, especially if you have other employees handling your cash and, and handling other aspects of your business. Um, we know that most of the uh, business owners out there may be one man shops, or they may have one employee that's doing everything, making, uh, receiving the cash in, uh, making the deposits, entering the deposits in whatever accounting system that you may be using, and then providing reports. And that can be kind of tricky at times uh, because there's no controls there over your assets and cash is a very liquid asset that can be easily diverted, uh, transferred to other accounts uh, without the, the knowledge of the owner. And it's really important, one, for the owner to always be involved in all aspects of the business, even while he's doing what he knows to do best. So internal control systems uh, and policies are put in place, one, to protect your assets, to ensure reliability of your accounting procedures, to promote efficient operations, create and uphold, um, uh, and create, uphold and update company policies as needed. Next slide, please. Principles of internal controls are designed to establish and separate responsibilities among employees. Um, if at all possible, you want one person, a secretary or receptionist to receive your monies in, make a list, make copies of the checks if necessary, of all monies received and then hand it to uh, the person or the individual that makes the deposits. And that way there is some separation in the handling of cash. Um, the principles of internal controls also requires you to maintain adequate records. And that goes back to a lot of the information that Courtney provided about tracking your receipts, tracking your vendor uh, invoices, tracking um, all your disbursements. Uh, using some kind of accounting system to uh, maintain that information and then having some good understanding of what it ought to look like when your financial statements are presented to you. Have an idea of, of what you should have um, earned in re revenues for that week, that month, and, and what is going out the door. So having adequate records really assists the business owner uh, in, in uh, ensuring that his assets or being well taken care of, and again, being able to make decisions on, um, on business matters. Uh, safeguarding assets from theft and fraud. Uh, separates record keeping from the custody of assets. Divide responsibility for related transactions. Again, that goes back to, uh, and, and that also includes inventory because a lot of inventory comes up missing. You have all these vendor bills and you don't know what has happened to your inventory. And uh, so that's in criti critically important. And then of course, having um, techn technological controls in place. Again, um, inventory management systems, uh, some type of accounting system, QuickBooks, uh, HoneyBook, uh, Wave or whatever uh, you wanna use to help track the ins and outs. Um, online banking um, also helps track, 
tracks your uh, cash disbursements and, and receipts and perform regular and independent audit and reviews. Um, I know that can be pretty expensive for small businesses, um, but at some point in your, in your business practice, uh, having an independent review, uh, uh, which is less, ex less expensive and a little lower service than an actual full-blown audit, but it definitely uh, provides you with great feedback as to how things are, are being managed, how transactions are being um, booked, if they've been booked timely, and just provides a lot of insight um, for the business owner in terms of how the business and the operations are being managed and ran. Next slide, please. So a little bit more uh, detail in, in terms of record keeping. Again, um, the most critical thing is protect because cash is king. I, I still use it. That's old school cash is king. If you don't have cash and you don't know where your cash is going, then you're going to have a hard time making purchases, especially if you're in a, an inventory uh, type of business. Um, and so protecting that cash and protecting your inventory um, need to be at the top of, of your list. Uh, I also believe that owners should have a basic idea, again, of what their weekly, monthly revenue uh, uh, should be, uh, what's, what's coming in and what's going out. I worked for Maze Chemical for uh, over 15 years of my professional career, and I don't know if you, you guys are pretty young, if you know William G. Mays, um, he ran a multi-million dollar operation, but Mr. Mays was very tight on internal controls. He understood, he went to school to understand financial reporting, number one. So he had a great idea of what his financial statement ought to look like. Um, he controlled, um, he selected all the vendors that were gonna be paid that week. And we paid weekly over 200 vendors. Um, he personally signed every check uh, that went out the that went out the door. He personally determined when those checks were going to be mailed, so he knew exactly um, for each. It may be over a five day period that he would mail out these 200, 250 checks, and he knew exactly how much was going out the door at a certain time, and he wanted to match the outgoing cash with incoming cash, and so. Um, it took, uh, uh, took us as an accountant and CPAs that worked for Mays to get him to want to do electronic signature because he just that did not believe in that. He believed in being personally uh, attached and in tune to what was going on with his company. Um, again, avoiding uh, having the same person um, that controls everything if the, somebody's over inventory you want to make sure there are other people that are doing other aspects of the inventory process. Someone that actually is doing the intake process of your inventory and recording um, the items as they come in and someone else handling the outgoing shipments of your inventory to make sure that nothing's coming up missing. Uh, human beings are driven by three motivators when it comes to uh, fraud and theft, and it's called the triple threat of fraud. One is there's opportunity. That means there's nobody watching them. They're taking, they're in control of a lot of aspects of the business. And so the opportunity presents itself uh, where internal controls are weak in the business. And so um, that's one motivator. The other motivator is from pressure. They're having financial problems. Uh, maybe someone in the family is very sick and they don't have insurance to cover it, or they want to keep up with the Joneses, or they just striving to look like they're successful. So the pressure of, of, of uh, um, the pressure of the financial pressure and society pressure sometimes uh, lures people into thinking that they. Um, can get away with theft and fraud, and some do. 
uh, for a while. Um, uh, the last part, you can't see it, is the rationalization. They rationalize um, their behavior. Um, well, he doesn't care. He's got plenty. The owner doesn't care. He's got plenty of money. He's not going to miss uh, these few $500 or $1,000 here and there. And, um, and so that, that motivates people to want to um, steal white collar crime. Next slide, please. Control of cash. Again, cash is your most liquid of all, liquid of all assets and it can be easily redirected and are hidden from the owner. An effective system of internal controls uh, separates the assets using three basic guidelines. Double checking that the handling of cash is separated from the record keeping of the cash. Cash receipts should be deposited in the bank within 24 to 48 hours or kept in a locked safe uh, until it's ready to be deposited. Uh, ensure that um, Uh, the cash that is received has been properly applied to customer accounts and that there is a reconciliation process going on monthly. I, I uh, uh, am very hard when it comes to tracking cash. I ensure with all my clients that bank reconciliations are done monthly. That's the number one at the top of the list and that all uh, transactions going in and out are accounted for. Um, make cash disbursements by check or debit card or ACH. And, and depending on the size of your firm and, and, and your policies in place um, and the dollar amount of outgoing checks to vendors, um, I recommend if, you're, if, if the owner's not there and the owner's not there signing checks that other um, managers, that there at least be two signatures on a check if it's over a certain a dollar amount, certain threshold. And I just use an example like $5,000. Maybe you need two signers on the check to keep everybody honest. When these uh, measures are in place, you'll be able to see your business grow. You'll be able to track and safeguard all of your assets and, 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 uh, and be prepared for future opportunities because you know where your, your cash is going. Um, some of the things to remember, which includes some of the uh, other part of my uh, presentation, um, the accounting portion of your business may seem time consuming or be put on the bottom line, but it's, the, it's one of the most important things that you need to keep in mind. Lack of proper internal controls and best practice accounting operations will result in um, inaccurate uh, preparation of financial statements. Financial statements actually represents a report card of, of who you are and what you're doing in your business. Most businesses fail within five years because owners uh, do what they do best and is typically not accounting or reviewing vendor records and bank statements. Accounting is one of the least celebrated aspects of the business, but it's the most important. And I suggest that uh, for you small business owners to take a, uh, an introductory course in, in accounting and financial statement presentation so you can have an idea uh, within yourself and feel comfortable within yourself of when your bookkeeper or accountant is presenting information to you um, that you're comfortable and ask good questions or ask any question if, you, uh, if things don't appear as you think they they ought to be on those uh, financial statement presentations. And so um, good internal controls and, uh, and uh, good financial statements or, or accurate financial statements, again, lends itself to your being able to be set and ready to get loans, to expand your business and to um, maybe venture off to other endeavors. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to fill out the Q&A.
Thank you, Lois. We greatly appreciate the information that you have shared. It was very valuable information. I hope that all of you after Lois's presentation will be able to get all A's on your report card um, and that you make sure that you have those safeguards in place. And don't forget the triple threat of fraud, the triple threat of fraud. Thank you once again, Lois. At this time, we're going to go to our next presenter, um, which is Ms. Kiana Davis, focusing on solutions you can count on. Mind Your Business has been providing clients tax and accounting services throughout central Indiana since 2015. At this time, I turn you into the hands of Ms. Kiana Davis. Good afternoon, um, everyone, and thank you to... Um the staff at IBE for putting this together and uh, those that have uh, made this possible. I am Kiana Davis and I am the CEO of Mind Your Business Accounting and Consulting. I do have a presentation to share and I will tell you, um, I am learning a lot. I hope you are with the information that was shared by uh, Lois and Courtney, but I'm here to talk about um, tax. And so I, as a former, former CFO, uh, Mind Your Business came to be um, to offer fractional CFO services and also focus on um, making sure that people understood what was going on in their business. But that led to um, the end of the year, and we all know the end of the year, and if you were like some of um, my clients who... Uh, uh, waited until yesterday to get all our tax documents. Um, you probably stressed out your uh, accountant <laughs> to close out yesterday. But I'm here to talk about taxes and tax strategy in particular. So I am what I would consider myself a tax strategist. My goal for my clients is really at the end of the year, after we've walked through um, making sure that KPIs are in order, that they are aware every month where they exist in their business, making sure that we understand their spending habits, where they want to make their investments in their business moving forward, um, where I think Lois said cash is king. And I think all accountants believe that it doesn't matter what's on your PL. If you don't have money in the bank to make your business run, um, you can have um, through some of some nifty accounting, uh, cruel accounting, you can make your PL look one way, but have no cash in the bank. So following kind of the cash flow of your company, then we get to the end of the year. And what I found is a lot of people dread the end of the year, this idea of the compliance that we have. And so really taking a step back to understand the reason why we have a lot of hesitation is because we're probably not prepared. We didn't do the small stuff that, that Courtney talked about and Lois talked about, but more importantly, making sure we don't have a big check to write um, our Uncle Sam because we've done all of our due diligence in not only strategizing in our company, but also strategizing on the tax perspective. Did you know that out of the uh, internal revenue code, almost 80% is devoted on business? Now, if you are like me, I'm always trying to follow the breadcrumbs to understand why policies put in place, what, what systems are put in place and why they're put in place. So that would tell me as a person who understands that the Internal Revenue Code is really set up to support businesses. And so our job is really to understand how can we use the Internal Revenue Code to support all of you. And so I wanna talk about tax strategy um, just a little bit and really making sure you understand what tax strategy is. And it's where we take your documents, we take your prior tax returns, we take um, your situations. We've walked through really what your year is going to look like, what it has looked like, and what are, how are you gonna prioritize your, your goals, your aspirations, your growth, right? Or some people, and I have clients who just says, I don't have the capacity to grow. And so we're in a stabilization mode. And how do we take all of that information and really get to the end of the year to make sure um, that we can minimize tax liability to the full extent of the law? So when you think about the roadmap to taxes um, and tax strategy, really there's an analysis. You have to be 
you have to have a come to yourself moment to say where you are in your finances and taxes and where you're not and trust a a trusted partner um, in an accountant, uh, a fractional CFO firm, wherever you're going to reach out to, to do an analysis as to where you are. Guys, there is nothing to be ashamed of if all your stuff is sitting in a box with receipts. What you have to be concerned is if you let that box sit and you do nothing about it. And so doing an overall analysis to see where you are. Then the next thing in tax strategy we have to understand is what is your optimal entity? What I found is many people rush to the state of Indiana and they go open up their LLC. But is the LLC a good entity for you to be in? Um, according to how you wanna take cash out of your company, how much tax liability you're gonna have. All of these things play a part in understanding what type of entity you want to be. And a lot of us try to do it ourselves without the assistance of someone who's going to at least help you a little bit um, and ask the necessary questions to understand, is an LLC right for you? Is a sole proprietorship? Is a partnership? Is a corporation, whether it's an S corp or a C corp? Then once you do that, you need to go and understand what all the deductions that are allowed to you. Now we've had a lot of tax changes um, probably more uh, tax changes than we've seen in the last 40 years, actually, since I've been alive. And I would tell you, as an accountant, we are trying to keep up with all the changes. First, the 2017 tax uh, restructuring. And then we have, of course, we're in this pandemic and there was some, some things that were allowed in the CARES Act and then the affordable um, I mean, the act that um, President Biden passed this year. And so you have to understand there are some there are some deductions that are very short term. There are some deductions that have been in the tax law for a long time, but understanding what your um, tax deductions are and maximizing that. Then we go to credits and loopholes. And I did say loopholes. I think loopholes in the name get a bad rap, but there are legal loopholes out there depending on your industry, what you're doing, how your cash flow is handled, what you want to invest in. And you need to get with a um, tax professional to understand what you are eligible for to minimize your tax uh, liability. Then we can get into some income shifting. And that's when we get really, really complex um, and, and doing some really neat stuff when it comes to tax strategy. And then at the end of the day, as we said, cash is king, you want to protect all your assets. And so that is also tax strategy and tax uh, liability minimization is a part of protecting what you have built. And so those are that's kind of the high level roadmap when you think about tax strategy. So optimizing business structure. So guys, I know you went to the uh, Secretary of State and you did the online form and you formed your LLC. But did you ask yourself the question, was that the right entity for me? And so you have to understand how each of these entities tax you. So propri sole proprietorship, you're a one man show. It goes on your 1040. What you make, your expenses is all captured on your 1040. Um, there really isn't anything you have to do with any other um, uh, governmental organization outside of reporting what you've made and all uh, allowable deductible expenses. Then there are some people who go into a partnership. So think of it as two sole proprietorships that came together, really the same thing. All of this flows through your 1040, your personal tax return. Then you said, you know what, I want some protection. I want something to get behind. And that's when we go to the Secretary of State usually and form this LLC. And so now you have a little bit of legal protection, but still, if you're a single member LLC, this stuff still flows through your 1040. So you have to make sure you understand all your business stuff. And then for some of us and a lot of micro businesses, um, we have our W-2s. And then we have what we call now, and hopefully will grow into more than just a side hustle and grow into um, really a business in which you can draw salary and uh, funds from. 
then let's say we want, you know what, we want a little bit more of um, protection or we want something different in our tax strategy. We can go to an S Corp, which is really just a tax structure under an LLC, or we can do an S Corp, which really, if you think about an S corporation, I mean, a C Corp, I should say, a C Corp, it really is its own living, breathing person, if you want to say that. And I call that for the big money makers. And then, of course, some of you might be doing something um, that's nonprofit uh, related. And so although there are no, um, you can't draw out profits out of that, um, you can structure uh, an organization, some social entrepreneurship um, that you're doing into a nonprofit, draw a reasonable salary and do that. But let's talk about the tax implications of all of that, right? So on average, what at least I'm seeing is the effective tax rate of, of a lot of people between 11% and um, 8%, I mean, 18%. Um, the, the tax levels, you can go out there to the IRS to see what the um, gradual tax rates are depending on what you've made. But here's the kicker. If you decide not to be in an S Corp or a C Corp, please know there's this thing called uh, self-employment tax. And we call that the double taxation effect of being a sole proprietorship, a partnership, and an LLC that doesn't have that S Corp um, designation. And so you have to be careful. So sometimes it's okay, right? You, you decide. And what it is, is that the government wants their uh, Medicare and their, um, they want the FICA part of that. And they want that out of the revenue that you actually earned. And so you have to work with your tax professional to understand when should I or if I should move from a different business entity so that the act, my business entity matches the activity I want to do. So activity could be, I want a different way to pay myself. I want to draw out money out of my company. You know what? I'm ready to draw a W-2 and do all of the quarterly and annual filings for that because I want to show that I earn money um, like an employee for my company. So those are all the questions you have to ask yourself when you're setting up your business and how we get to the end of the year from a tax strategy perspective. And so just a little bit more about self-employment tax. So like I said, 15.3% is the self-employment tax. So if you earn $100, $15.03 is going back as an assessment for self-employment tax. If you are doing a Schedule C or um, you have um, uh, an S Corp with a K-1, et cetera, just know uh, that if you don't do an S Corp or a C Corp, you are in this moment subject to what we call the self-employment tax, which could be double taxation. And so again, um, the IRS describes it as really taking your Social Security and Medicare tax that you would have paid if you got a W-2. But since you're not getting a W-2, the government still wants that on your behalf and they're going to get it through your tax return. And that's why um, the S-Corp was formed so that you can avoid some of that uh, double taxation. And then I'm gonna leave you with this and hopefully open it up for questions that you might have. Guys, there is a difference between tax preparation and tax strategy. Please don't go to your tax preparer expecting them to find every little loophole deduction that really you paid them maybe a couple hundred dollars to prepare your taxes. Tax preparing is when you are required every year to prepare your taxes, whether you do it yourself or you hire a professional. That it is not the responsibility per se of a tax preparer to make sure that, that they understand what you need out of tax strategy or tax, uh, uh, tax liability minimization. Tax preparing is all about compliance. We as citizens of this United States are required if you earn money, if you earn any type of money through an employer, through a gig, whatever, to report that and prepare your taxes accordingly as a means of our requirement as citizens. Tax planning says throughout the year, we're gonna effectively manage the taxpayer's financial situation to minimize the tax burden at the federal state level. 
those are two different things, guys. And I want to make sure you understand the difference. Now, can both of those activities exist in one person, one firm? Absolutely. However, just know the difference so that you don't go to your tax preparer all in a tiffy because they didn't know that this deduction or you should have gotten certain deductions because if they have not prepared your books throughout the year or have walked through you, walked with you through an, uh, an annual financial uh, uh, cycle, then you cannot expect them to know every nuance about you and your finances at all outside of what you bring to them to prepare your taxes. So I'm Kiana Davis. I'm the CEO of Mind Your Business Accounting and Consulting, where we specialize in tax strategy and fractional CFO services. And I'm here to answer any questions that any of you might have. Thank you, Kiana. We greatly appreciate all the information that you shared. We have to optimize that business structure that was so important that 15.3% stuck out for me. Um, so thank you for that as well. And make sure you're preparing for your taxes. Tax preparation is important, absolutely important. We are grateful for all of the panelists that we've heard from today, some expert information that you didn't even have to pay for. So it was great what we've heard at this time we're going to just dig into some of the questions. Make sure you're dropping your questions in um, the Q&A so that we're able to be able to present those. First question comes from Carol. How do I understand the best structure for my business to minimize the liability? Can I change the structure? Kiana, we'll send this one over to you. So you really need to uh, work with a tax professional to understand uh, what is your optimal entity? And I say that because um, it really depends on what you're trying to achieve um, in your business and in your personal uh, financial situation. You can always uh, change entities. There are a lot of people who start off as sole proprietorship and then say, you know, I want to elevate to something different like an LLC. And then when we get to the LLC uh, portion, what they, what I get clients that have the aha moment is my LLC produces a schedule C if I'm a sole member and they don't think that they don't, they're like, oh, that should be, I had a client that said, well, you should file that separate. I said, no, it's on your 1040 as an attachment schedule C. And you have to understand these are flow through entities. When you don't want it to be a flow through entity, that means you say, I literally want this wall of separation between my business taxes and my personal taxes. That's when we're talking about corporations. And that's why corporations are formed with shareholders and et cetera. So it really depends on your situation. Um, it works. Like if you are a W-2 earner and you have a side um, a gig, right? And you're earning that through a Schedule C, at some point you might say, you know what? Um, I'm ready to uh, protect my personal finances from my businesses. So I need to get into another entity that does that for me. Great, great response, Kiana. Another question coming right at you. Um, please give examples of income shifting tax strategy. <laughs> um, so um, I'm just high level. Um, I think everyone has heard of holding companies. And so a lot of companies, a lot of bigger companies use a tactic called holding companies. And you can, in essence, own multiple companies and use one to fund another or invest in, a, in another. It can get complex. So I'll, I, again, I would advise you to connect with um, uh, Lois or Courtney or myself who um, are probably experts in this so that we don't guide you wrong just with um, answering this online. However, um, just think about holding companies and what can exist under the holding companies. Uh, Lois, this question's for you. At what time does my business need or require a CPA? Is it at day one uh, when I have a million dollars of revenue? Um, when is the good time for me to have a CPA? And Lois, you may have to unmute because um, we're not hearing your response. Uh, my suggestion is to at least consult with a, um, uh, a good um, accountant 
or a CPA on the front end because they can help you um, structure your accounting system. As Courtney said, you need to have a chart of accounts, which is, which is like your, your roadmap to where you want to uh, record various transactions, what bucket you want your income in, uh, how you want to classify receipts. And at least on the front end, I know a lot of our small entrepreneurs may not have the funds to engage uh, a CPA, on the front end, but at least consult with somebody and maybe they can just give you some um, insight on getting your chart of accounts structure. That is so key at the beginning. I have ran into a num number of small entities that have put a chart of accounts together that is just not workable. And it was much easier, more cost effective for me to start from zero and re-enter everything than trying to redo what they put in place. And so, Starting off with a good chart of accounts, a good accounting system, as Courtney uh, alluded to, um, it doesn't have to be real expensive. I didn't even know about those other ones. QuickBooks was, you know, and some other platforms that I've used. Um, but um, just day one, just to, you know, get started on the right foot, the right path, and then maybe, you know, put them aside until you start building up some some revenue to be able to, to pay uh, a professional on a regular basis. Thank you, Lois. We're so glad for all of these experts that are on the line. Um, next question coming from Tanya. Does anyone work with Sage 100 or 300? Um, she's saying that they're currently on QuickBooks and want to switch, but they heard it's hard to find an accountant that is proficient in that software. Any of you have experience with Sage 100, 300? Can share some information with Tanya. I don't. I don't have any experience with that platform. I don't either. Um, and it, it, it's, it is going to be hard to find somebody, unfortunately. And why does she want to switch to Sage? What's what? She's switching. Oh, yeah. I, I, would, I would ask the same question as well. Why, why does she want to switch? I mean, there are other not-for-profit accounting software platforms out there. Um, but uh, why Sage? Tanya, if you don't mind typing in for us why it is that you um, want to switch to Sage. I um, understand her outgrowing QuickBooks, you know, possibly. And I while you're doing um, while you're doing that, Tanya, we'll go to the next question and give you time to be able to respond. Um, coming from Ida, um, is anyone accepting new clients? I don't live in the area. Any of you accepting new clients? Lois, Kiana. <laughs> Lois is looking like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Y'all were a little I am. To I'm, I'm, I'm in my to... senior. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm accepting new clients. So yes. you can go to my website and, okay. and go there. So what I offer, um, I actually have a product uh, for micro businesses that's called assisted accounting for people who feel that they have the capacity to do accounting themselves. But as Lois said, help them with the setup of a chart of accounts and, and meet with them um, on a quarterly basis just for question and answer. And it's an affordable product until you grow out of kind of the, the small micro gig. Uh, so go to my website, teamnyb.com. Um, just know that um, I will also, I also do tax strategy. So that's also um, bundled into all of that. I'm Thank sorry. You, I'm kind of I'm kind of in my twilight years now. So. <laughs> Lo 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 Lois, uh, uh, we'll we'll translate that. <laughs> okay. Next, uh, we're going back to Tanya, who was asking the question in regards to Sage. Um, Tanya says she's a general contractor, so that's why she's utilizing. Um, wants to consider using that Sage 100 or Sage 300. She said they've outgrown QuickBooks and Sage seems to have everything we need to operate in and out of our construction business. Any thoughts, comments on that? No, I don't have any experience with it and I have not researched that product for any of my clients. I will say I, I am currently um, on the board of a nonprofit that does use Sage and they've used it for 20 years and we are having a huge um, learning curve in bringing in um, uh, 
newer accounting firms, newer uh, professionals that don't have any experience in Sage. It's been very difficult for us as we've had turnover in the organization. So um, if you're having a hard time finding potentially an accountant or somebody with that skill set, then it might be even harder in the future when you have when you need assistance or want to outsource. So. Oh, thanks, Courtney. That's good information. Um, LaShawn, um, hi, I've been a booth rent um, salon with independent workers. I'm about to move into employees and need to know how to properly set up my business. Where do I begin setting up my new business? Who wants to take that one? Courtney, since you're up, I can, I'm looking right dead at you. Uh, why don't you start with that one and then we'll pass it to Lois and Kiana for additional information. So if I'm, if I'm understanding right, um, you have done booth rent in the past, but now at a new location, your stylist will actually be employees. Um, so I think to reflect back on what Kiana said, the first thing is understanding what structure you want to be in. Um, and there's definitely tax implications in deciding if you want to be a sole proprietor or an LLC. There's also risk implications. So like Kiana said, when you set up the LLC, the one benefit is you create that barrier between um, you and and the business. There's a little bit of protection there. So when you are a sole proprietor, you do have to keep in mind um, that you are the business. So if you now at a hair salon have a brick and mortar, you have people coming in and out, you have employees, um, you do have risk in that. And obviously you, you need insurance to cover that risk. But even if there was something that were to happen um, and you there was a lawsuit, you individually are, that, are um, on the hook for that risk. So if you have um, your own vehicles, if you have a 401k, you have a home, all of that is up to grab. So there are some things to consider in deciding both risk and tax implications if you want to be a sole proprietor or an LLC. Either way, you can have employees um, under either structure. Um, and uh, you do need to work with the Department of Workforce Development. If you come to your local ISBDC office, we can help you. I will encourage you to really look at, I know for beauty salons, um, really what your market is going to want because some beauty salon um, that, you know, the cosmetologists themselves want booth rent or they want commission based or they want hourly. So you really need to look at that side of it as well on um, being able to effectively recruit and retain stylists um, on what model is going to be best uh, for you going forward. Uh, do know that when you switch though to employees um, from having independent contractors, when you're looking at what you're going to pay them or commission, you really have got to be looking at, you now have employer taxes that you're responsible for. Um, and that that's around nine, you know, nine to 10%, depending where you're at. And, um, you know, that's on you now. Um, so you've really got to look at that with tips and everything and just what that is going to add up um, on you as the employer when you're making this transition. Thank you, Courtney. Great information for um, LaShawn. Um, another question for you, Courtney. What other items, taxes, et cetera, should I have separate accounts for? Coming uh, well, from Dwayne. So it depends on your business. Okay. And, and my, and the reason I say this is when I look at clients sometimes, especially sales tax, where they're like, I was doing fine until I had to pay sales tax. Well, sales tax wasn't yours. You're, you're collecting that on behalf of the state of Indiana. So the fact that you use it to pay your light bill, it's not the state of Indiana's fault that now you don't have the money to pay your sales tax. So it's really a matter of you organizing your business. And some people, you know, when they look at the division of their business, it's like, this service revenue is going to pay my employees or, you know, this um, area of my business, uh, let's say you have um, three divisions of your business and you really want to make sure that each di division um, on its own is profitable and it's paying for its own expenses. That could be um, a time where you have three different accounts and income and expenses for each division are coming out and maybe a percentage of income for each go to an operational account that pays your general items like um, insurance and rent. It just, again, it goes back to Kiana's points on your strategy, even though that's not a tax strategy, but just your overall strategy in your business so that you um, are, be able, are able to track and um, make sure you have cash. Like Kiana said, cash is king. And again, w when we see businesses, a lot of times they things hit and it all comes up on you, right? You don't realize that you scheduled payroll weeks to be the same as your vendors are due and now you don't have cash. <laughs> so it really uh, depends on your business. So I would look down and I would, I would look to see um, if you do have areas that you want to be self-sustaining and it would make more sense for you to take that money out and put it in its account on its own. Um, you know, in our one 
one client I work with, um, we do it by funding source because, because there's, there's reasons for that, but where their income streams come in, um, they want to be able to track and know that that income that came in for that project is only then going out for expenses for that project. So don't hear me say, go have seven accounts. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, but if there, if you've had issue with cash flow, if you've got issue with taxes or one part of your business, and it would help you mentally to have them separate. So you're not looking at your account and thinking you're good to go make this advertising campaign spend. And then remember that you've got this huge, you know, account that's coming due uh, that you're paying independent contractors out of. So, but um, again, anybody at the small business development center, this is what we do. Um, sorry, I didn't get to talk a lot in the beginning because of the tech issues, but everything we do uh, for our clients is um, at no cost. So, um, and it's more this guidance when you get to the point where you want somebody to do the accounting or the tax strategy for you, that is when you outsource and go to um, Kiana or Lois. Uh, but we will sit down and do that high level review and strategize with you on what makes sense. Thanks, Courtney. Um, as we see here, uh, Jacqueline has a quick question in regards to do any of you assist not for profit organizations and would be willing to take on a new client in that space? Yeah, I do. I have my local love. businesses. It's oh, not I'm sorry. Right. No, go ahead, Laura. I'm sorry. I do uh, do a lot of service work for not-for-profits, um, primarily religious organizations, but I've had other um, community type of not-for-profit organizations, mentoring uh, organizations for not-for-profits. So um, I, I, do, I do enjoy that kind of work. <laughs> yeah, ditto. Um, half my book of business is nonprofit here where a nonprofit can't really um, afford um, uh, accounting controller CFO. And so they bring in someone like Lois or myself. So mm -hmm. it depends on how you want to engage, whether it's external or internal. So a lot of people I serve are internal. Um, when is a good time to engage, hire, consult with a CPA? We talked a little bit about that earlier, but if you can just give us just a little bit more information, even of how to find one. <laughs> well, um, one, for if you're really looking for a certified public accountant, you can go on the um, State Board of Accountancies list and there they have uh, the State Board of Accountancy has a listing of all um, CPAs that are in good standing with the board. And so there are there is a list out there of, um, of CPAs. Um, also, you know, I did want to follow up on the question of, with the booth. Uh, the um, hair the hair salon with the booth and she started by having employees. I would definitely highly recommend that she consult with and engage an accountant if she's going to start doing payroll uh, because that will shut a business down faster than anything. If you're not reporting those payroll taxes timely, uh, the state is the worst when it comes to um, um, get, sending out warrants for lack of uh, receiving taxes, where there's sales tax, where there's payroll. Um, once you start reporting, you have to be consistent on the reporting or you will get a large assessment. And so payroll is no joke because there are so many levels uh, with dealing with payroll, not only just issuing checks, but doing the 941s, which is a quarterly report, doing the quarter report to the workforce, Indiana workforce development. Um, and, and doing your, your um, WH1s reporting to your, the state, the Department of Revenue. And it's all very time sensitive. And if you're not, you know, if that, that beauty uh, technician, the salon technician is not familiar with payroll taxes, she really, really, really needs to engage uh, an accountant, Kiana or Someone else, no, I, I, I do do payroll, but it's so time consuming. <laughs> it is, I'm going to piggyback with Lois. I, let me tell you when I get clients who get tax warrants and they, they like, what, when you set up your business, first of all, I have found it much easier to work with the IRS than the state of Indiana department. Right, me too. I'm just gonna put that out there. So you might not want to mess with the state of Indiana and their money, I'm right. telling you. It is hard to negotiate. It is hard to maneuver. When they want their money, they want their money right yes. there. And so if you don't know what you're doing, 
I guarantee it is the best money because you're going to pay our fee with assessments, penalty, interest. You would have paid for us and the headache. Some of you guys ain't living in peace because you got right. out uh, the IRS and the Department of Revenue on your, I'm being honest now. That's right. Because you tried to do it your way just spend the money and hire a professional. I guarantee you, you will sleep good at night because there will be no one knocking at your door, putting chains on your door. Let's lock it down. It will lock your door down. And when you get into payroll, the IRS nor the state play with payroll taxes because an, an employee then has to file taxes. And there is an assumption that that money is there for them to file their taxes. So not only are you messing with you, but you're messing with any employee you you hired who then has a statutory requirement to file their taxes. And what I get a lot of times is, oh, I'm going to do this myself. Then you don't ha- you have the Department of Workforce Development, you have unemployment tax, you have a tax account for revenue, you have a tax account for sales, you have a tax account for payroll withholding. So you have about seven tax accounts. And and federal you unemployment form that just came to you <laughs> and you are freaking out because you opened up seven tax accounts and don't know what they are. Hire an accountant. Right. All right. I think that was crystal clear. Hire <laughs> an accountant <laughs> and, and do not delay. Do not delay That's right. trying to figure out when to do it. When you open your doors, make sure you have an accountant to walk in them. <laughs> OK, let's go um, to a few more questions. Uh, Kiana, um, which entity is best, an LLC or a corporation? Um, so it just it depends. And I'm just going to give a rule of thumb. I always say, if you're an LLC trying to move to an S-Corp, here's the difference. In an S-Corp, you have to pay yourself payroll. When you are ready to pay yourself payroll, you're probably ready for an S-Corp. Okay, great response. We have another question from Dwayne. Do you really have corporate clients with zero corporate income taxes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Kiana say it's real. She says it's real. real. Amazon pays zero because there's deductions, credits, and loopholes. There are so many credits out there. You can be in an opportunity zone. You can, I mean, there, there, it's just when you don't get with a professional to navigate through all of this, you, you will, you will miss out on those opportunities where the government is really saying they're trying to move the the community in a certain way of investing when they make up these new rules for credits and things like that you got to follow that stuff if you're in a certain industry so um the idea that uh we have certifications for women and minority there that's a reason right because there is an investment in the idea we want to incentivize people who connect with these businesses so yes, it is absolutely possible. R&D tax credits. I mean, you name the gamut. There is a lot out there. What people don't know, even in the, in the self-employment tax through the what Biden signed, President Biden signed, you can defer your self-employment um, tax for two years. People don't even know that, right? To say, well, my cash flow could be a little bit better in 2022. I'm going to save the money in account, like Courtney said, set up that account and um, allow my cash to be invested. So that's when you get into really strategy, you know, um, in your business. So absolutely. Strategy is required. Uh, w- another question for you, Kiana. Um, I have an LLC with little activity and have no not filed taxes. Should I? Uh, yes. <laughs> and I get this a lot um, because you opened up your LLC three years ago and thought you was going to do something. You didn't do it. And then now you want to start doing some stuff, right? Um, absolutely. And honestly, I think for a lot of funding, and Courtney can probably answer this, you probably need two years of showing that you've been in existence, right? For a lot of business credit. So it really is advantageous for you to go back, um, even if it's small, right? You can report $100 and $50. You're on the books of starting a business in that tax year, which gives you a level of credibility out there through DUNS and all of that. That really came into to play, Kiana, with... Um... Um, all the federal recovery options. So you had to show that you had been in business prior to COVID. And there were a lot of people that maybe had 
formed a structure. There was no activity. Um, so you're right on the business credit. And then again, you just never know, especially right now, what those opportunities are going to be in the future. Um, so having things um, truly documented, because I see that a lot, people not claiming revenue because of this $600. Um, Uh, actually made 600, but by not claiming it, if you ever want to be able to show for business credit, then you're at a downfall, you know, by, by not um, starting to collect that, even if it was cash or if it was small or it was family and friends, um, there's sometimes that benefit of making that investment um, to be able to show, show yourself in the future. So what you're you. saying, I have a question. I have a question for Courtney. So what you're saying is people opted to take the stimulus instead of structuring their business to get access to some of this funding like PPP, IDLE, and et cetera. Well, you couldn't really, I saw people sometimes saying, take your stimulus and start a business so that you could do, um, get advantage, take advantage of these federal options. Well, at the time when people were saying that, that wasn't really the case because there's a date, February 15th of 2020 is, is the federal date for most of these opportunities. But now we are seeing um, the new restaurant revitalization fund that came out. That was for startups. You could, or you could actually not even be started yet as a restaurant restaurant owner and be able to claim your expenses to get access to those fun to those funds. Um, so now we do see that. But yeah, if you didn't actually take it and structure your business and start having activity, um, you're not going to be able to, to take advantage of these opportunities. And one opportunity that is still available, available that a lot of people don't know about, you did have to be open actually back in October. But the restart grant in Indiana, if you've not looked into this yet, the um, uh, regulations keep changing. So people think they don't qualify maybe because they read about it when it first came out, but it is back open. Um, and you do have to show that you were profitable in 2019, uh, but you're able to do that off of the EBITDA calculation. So you get to add depreciation back in. So if you have a lot of assets you, and you showed um, a loss in 2019, you probably will show a profit once you add all that back in. And you have to show a loss in revenue of 30% uh, in a given month to qualify, but it doesn't have to be for the whole year. So you could qualify in May and then not June, but then in July um, and it's back open. So if you had a loss last month, you can apply and it's up to $10,000 in reimbursable expenses for a given month with a $50,000 cap. So if you haven't looked into it, um, yeah, that is something from the state of Indiana. And we don't know what new recovery um, options are going to be available from Biden's new um, relief package. So again, a really important reason to be thinking about this, be thinking about your financials, getting them in order for day-to-day -day operations, but then also just the climate we're in within the economy. What was the name of this new one, Courtney? Well, this one's the Restart Grant, and it's specifically okay. from the state of Indiana. It's on a federal Go grant. On. State of oh, Indiana. okay. But Courtney, um, uh, organizations who are restaurants or in that can still apply for the uh, restaurant redivided, I mean, that grant. If, if it has, oh, that one, yeah. As long as the funds haven't ran out. The one thing with that uh, program, uh, I don't know, I haven't heard that they've ran out, but if you are a restaurant, make sure you, if they haven't ran out, you apply like right now because yeah. that wasn't available to just small businesses. Larger businesses could, ap could apply for that grant too. What well, mm -hmm. was funding? And and I will say this too, um, they are reserving this time period up until uh, May 23rd mm -hmm. for women and economically disadvantaged mm -hmm. uh, folks. So right. if you fall in that, you want to get at the top of the list because to Courtney's point, this stuff, there's no, there's not a limit, unlimited uh, amount of money. Um, so you probably have until this Friday to apply for this grant. And we can help you do that. The ISBDC actually has webinars and office hours if you do have any questions. But the online application was actually pretty easy, but you do have to uh, be able to access some financial information. Courtney, another question coming your way. What are quarterly estimated payments and how do I make them? So to Kiana's point, when you become an LLC, um, the government wants their money early. Um, so just like you pay into your uh, taxes every uh, month, if you're an employee, uh, they want to see that earlier. So you are to estimate what you think you're going to owe at the end of the year. So you, uh, again, having everything together so that you can actually see what your income has been in that quarter, what your estimated expenses are to come and knowing your tax bracket to come up with a good estimate. And then you uh, pay that to the government. And then when you file your taxes in the, the year, if you've made an overpayment, then, you know, obviously you get that back. Um, and 
you can't, there are some regulations around if you underpay, there could be penalties. So you got to be careful. Um, but that is something to be aware of because if you ran as a sole proprietor, just paying at the end of the year, when you make that um, determination to switch to an LLC, you have to start looking into quarterly estimated taxes. So again, it goes into, um, and I was going to chime in when we were talking about a CPA, um, this is something that you should outsource. When we start a business because we love baking cakes or um, we're great in technology, so we'd be a tech consultant, whatever it is, you're passionate about that and you start because of that. And then all of a sudden now, boom, you're a marketing person and you're an HR person and you're a financial person. It does not make sense to stay up till two in the morning trying to put in items in QuickBooks and wonder if you're doing it right. If you bill, you yourself as a service consultant, you might bill $100 an hour, $50 an hour. You spending what's going to take you four hours where it would take Kiana and Lois 30 minutes, it's not a good use of money, you know, so you really have got to look, it may not be necessarily a CPA, there's bookkeepers, like Kiana said, she has fractional um, CFO services, so you really need to analyze what you need for your business, but you could be really losing out on potential income because of the time you're spending trying to do something you don't want to do, and that you're probably not that great at, because that's not what you're in for it. Um, so, so definitely looking at that and, and having that help, I think is, will help you on that question too. Amy. Thank you, Courtney. Um, this question will just open up to anyone that wants to weigh in. It's coming from LaShawn. Um, please tell me how I can get a line of credit for my business. Um, a line of credit. Uh, you're probably going to have to be personally, uh, a personal guarantor on that line of credit with a financial institution. Um, this is my recommendation. If you're starting off, I would make sure you are registered with uh, a DUNS number. I would um, also uh, go to sam.gov, never hurts. And then um, you want to go, if you're just uh, trying to establish business credit outside of your personal Start with a lot of the companies that offer easy uh, net 30 terms. And um, I found like um, Staples or some of the, a lot of the office um, businesses will offer uh, net 30s to start building that business credit until you build that credit, which probably will take about two years to do without a personal uh, guarantee, you'll have a personal guarantee. Thank you, comment, oh, um, go ahead, Lois. Yes, my comment has always been when you're a startup business, uh, three things you always want to do, and that's to establish a good relationship with a banking person, a bank manager. Again, consult with a CPA. And um, thirdly, um, I forgot the third thing, but there's a, a lawyer, you know, and have consult with an attorney. Those are the three people that you need in your corner when you start a business. Even if you're not ready to pay them, at least be able to reach out to someone that would be willing to uh, guide you in the right direction. Um, one, to Kiana's point, one thing you might wanna look into is bankable.org. So they actually have a um, just like a starter $500 loan um, to get you started in credit. So it kind of depends on are you looking at to establish credit or do you need it for cash flow reasons? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, your lender is where you want to start. You usually do have to have some type of um, capital or guarantee that, that you can support that line of credit. Um, but just really, really be careful. Don't let your need for cash affect the future long term. Um, viability of your business. Because I have seen people before, I had somebody during COVID, hired somebody, um, paid them $50,000. I wanted to cry um, to get them a loan, but it was a loan that you paid for daily. Like it came out of their um, uh, credit card sales daily. And now they are just, they're upside down. So that, that need for cash right then um, really is going to impact them for a very long time. Um, so, so be cautious of that too. So a line of credit though is great for inventory based businesses, you know, cash flow type businesses that are up and down that you kind of need to access that cash, but you're going to pay it off in the next 30 to 60 days. Um, so you really need to look to see what loan product you need. Um, but just be really careful with online lenders and and do work with an ISPDC consultant or a CPA to make sure you understand the long term um, ramifications of that. 
Thanks, Courtney. This is another question coming your way. And then others, um, Kiana and Lois, uh, please feel free to weigh in on this as well. Um, can a tax advisor help me create a business plan? Um, I mean, they probably can, but I mean, I've not met one that offers that as their line of services. So, I mean, a business plan, there's typically two um, aspects of that. There's the narrative part, which is your business model. Who's your customers? How are you going to market to them? Um, you know, what is your competitive advantage? You know, what, what is your long-term strategy um, in the types of hires you need to make. Then you have the financial side, which you typically want to have a three-year pro forma that you are estimating your sales. I know Lois said before, you know, it is really important for you, even if you're just starting out or if you've been in business for five years, looking at the next couple of years and making some projections, they are kind of guesses, but they give you that roadmap and that benchmark to work towards. Um, that area um, a tax strategist might be able to help with a CPA can definitely help with, um, and a tax strategist could help on, on the income streams like Kiana was talking about and how you're going to structure. But when it comes to the actual, like meat and bones of your business model, um, you probably would be best, better suited. Um, you know, again, working with more of an ISBDC professional to be truthful. Um, the benefit of working with our office, um, is that, we work with hundreds and thousands of clients every single year. And we are talking about from the mom and pops to manufacturers to um, everything, auto mechanic, lawn, just starting, been in business a hundred years. And we're not just talking about financials. We're talking about how do you reconnect with customers? How do you um, use technology? What apps are out there? We're continuously doing this research and we're able to take all of it and kind of tell you in real time, you know, what's out there. Um, so I think to Lois's part, point, it's your team. Right. So I, you know, not one person are you going to probably find to do everything. So you need a tax strategist, but probably not to do your business plan. Thank you, Courtney. Um, Yvonne has a question. Where can I get help setting up my nonprofit QuickBooks system? I can't help with that. Now I, I will help with that. Of course, for a fee. <laughs> <laughs> Small. <laughs> yes, I, I've, I have established, uh, and that was part of my business model as well, was the um, uh, training, installation, and setup of various software platforms for clients. And uh, we would have in-house training for a number of clients, especially most of them gravitated to QuickBooks. I'm a QuickBook, QuickBooks Pro Advisor. And so um, we would have in-house training um, slide projection, everybody have their laptops and install QuickBooks and go through um, the modules and, and how to um, keyboard through it. Thank you, Lois. Uh, Kiana, yeah. was there anything you wanted to add on that? No, um, I agree. I'm a QuickBooks Pro advisor too. So um, I'm here to assist um, in any way. Um, although Lois is sunsetting there, I see. <laughs> <laughs> And, and given a whole lot of caveats. I know, given a whole <laughs> lot of parameters. <laughs> That's it. We love you, Lois. You know that. <laughs> I'm just um, being honest. Here's, <laughs> it is. here's another question. Who is ultimately responsible for the financial results that happen within a business? Um, is that the bookkeeper, the CFO, CEO, the owner, president, board of directors? Who is responsible? Lois, can you take that one? Uh, yes. Uh, depending on the situation, each of them can be individually responsible and jointly responsible uh, for any uh, fraudulent uh, financial information that's presented uh, to bankers, to attorneys, to the state trying to get contracts. Um, but the ultimate responsibility is going to fall on the owner at the top and from the top down, the guidance and, uh, should be given and, um, uh, integrity and trustworthiness should start at the top and then filter down. Um, but all can be held, uh, jointly or individual libel if there is intentional fraud and, um, and, uh, theft. Thank you um, for that answer, Lois. Uh, well, 
Time flies when you're having fun. So this concludes <laughs> our session for today. I would like to thank Courtney and Lois and Kiana for participating in this afternoon's session. You can visit the Minority Business Series page at indianablackexpo.com for additional information and resources to help you with your business. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope that you gain some very important information to help grow your business and sustain your business. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Kiana. Learned a lot. Thank, Thank you, Courtney. You. Thank nice you all. Nice meeting you guys. Bye.